if our spiritual roots are not in the right place and if we are not strengthening those things. And so we spent the first, I don't even know how many weeks, six, seven, eight weeks here, uh, looking specifically at our root system and being rooted in the right places, being rooted, first of all, in Christ, being rooted uh, in Christ in the sense of being saved so that we have put down our roots in Him for our eternal salvation. And then we looked at being rooted in His Word. We looked at being rooted in His truth, being rooted in His wisdom, being rooted in His love. We looked at being uh, having a rooted family. We looked at what is a rooted church. And now we're going to lift our eyes from the root ball uh, that cannot be seen below the ground. Again, that's why we focused on the roots. That's the part that can't be seen, but that is the most vital part of our Christian walk. Now we lift our eyes up to the fruits. And we are going to look at the first fruits this morning or this evening. We are going to look at the fruits of the resurrection, starting here that the fruits of the resurrection. I mentioned this morning in the service that uh, these two gentlemen who are very anti-Christian wanted to attack two key doctrines or two key points in the Bible. One was the resurrection, the other was the, um, uh, the salvation or the conversion of, this, of Saul to become the Apostle Paul. Well, we talked about the conversion of Saul this morning. Tonight we talk about the resurrection a little bit. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why is that so pivotal to our faith? It is extraordinarily pivotal. If we remove the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we remove everything upon which we stand. Because if it falls, if it fails, then everything that is built on top of that fails and the whole structure collapses. And so I want to take some time here to talk about this, uh, to talk about the fruits of the resurrection. First, we're going to look at the proof of the resurrection this evening, the proof of the resurrection. Um, look at, you're in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at verse number 20. 1 Corinthians, 15, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 says this, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end when, shall all have, when he shall um, have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And then verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Rootedness in Christ brings about an expected end. That's one of the blessings of being Christian is we have the last chapter already. We already have an idea of where things go on and whether or not we completely agree on eschatology. We have a general understanding, a general agreement on where things are leading where they're going and where we as Christians are going to end up, unless you drastically disagree eschatologically and only believe that the 144,000 are the only ones that are going to be uh, going to heaven and everybody else has to stay here on this earth. But um, that would be kind of what the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses teach, uh, not what the Bible teaches. But I'll set that aside for a second here. It brings about an expected end in, the, in eternity, but it also brings about another expected end here on this earth. What does that rootedness in Christ bring? Well, what does any good fruit bring? Or any good um, uh, root system bring? Well, it brings fruit. Whether that fruit be the pine cone or that fruit be uh, something edible or it is the flower or any other number of things, rootedness in Christ brings about fruit. And so if we plant our roots deeply down in Him, we get this fruit. I want to look here at the proof of the resurrection. Christian fruit is twofold. The changes that God works in us personally to make us more like Christ, this is you know, spiritual fruit like Galatians 5, 22 and 23 talk about. And then there's another kind of fruit. There's the fruit of the reproduction of leading others to Christ and of aiding them in their spiritual growth. And we have two kinds of fruit here, becoming more like Christ 
and reproducing by leading others to Christ. And both of these areas of fruit are intertwined in our life in such a way that we cannot remove one from the other. They affect one another. If I am not becoming more and more like Christ, I'm not going to be much of a testimony and a witness to others. I'm not going to be able to lead others to Christ. And if I'm not being a testimony and a witness, there's probably not other fruits that are being grown in my life either. They are produced at the same time by the same means of the same roots. So we don't want to separate them. So now we're going to trace through the New Testament here the fruit that God desires to bear in the lives of his children. And we start here with the resurrection of Christ. Not only is it the cornerstone of our faith, but its result gives us the power for every other kind of fruit bearing. The cornerstone of our faith, meaning that uh, so many other doctrines rest upon that cornerstone of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's vital. It is important. So I want us to think about the context here of this passage before we go back to it again. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, Satan is trying to counteract the truth. This is the way it was in the church at Corinth. Um, they were being taught by somebody uh, the, uh, that the resurrection was not true. Somebody was trying to discredit the Christian faith completely by removing the veracity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's foundational to our faith. And so Paul is confronting these claims in chapter 15. He first, he points out to the many eyewitness testimonies of the resurrection of Christ. In verses 4 through 8, he says, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was, by the way, according to the scriptures, what scriptures is he speaking of? Old Testament scriptures. That's what he's speaking of. He rose again the third day just like the Old Testament said he would. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen, Paul says, of me also, as of one born out of due time. So in the beginning here, he talks about all of the wit eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Christ. Next, he points to the centrality of the, res of the resurrection um, of Jesus Christ to our faith by asking a question. Look at verse number 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? He's going to point out something here in these next several verses, philosophically, what the absence of the resurrection would mean to our faith. If we were to say, well, listen, I can buy a lot of the things that Jesus did and said, but when it comes to raising from the dead, that is just a step too far for me. I can't, I can't buy that kind of a miraculous thing. That is contrary to nature, to rise from the dead. Paul says, okay, fine. If you say that, verse number 13, then Christ is not risen from the dead. He says, okay, if you can't believe that, verse 14, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. It is useless. It is empty. It is meaningless. It is pointless. I am just standing up and making a whole bunch of noise and nothing more. He says, if you can't believe that, then we are false witnesses, verse number 15. Because we said that God raised Jesus up. In verse number 17, then that means that we are still dead in our sins, therefore under the law. In verse number 17. In verse 18, Christians who have already died, they've perished eternally. Because if Jesus cannot be resurrected, then they cannot be resurrected. And here we talk about the physical resurrection of their bodies one day. And then in verse number 19, if you can't accept Christ's resurrection, in verse number 19, if we have hope of eternal life in this life only, but it's actually just a false hope, then we are of all men most miserable. Because here we have dedicated ourselves to a lie upon which nothing of any value can be built. Basically, Paul is pointing out that if Christ is not risen from the dead, if there is no resurrection of the saints, then we might as well just pack up and go home. 
and start planning our Super Bowl party for the, whenever it happens, I'm not sure. But he ends his argument with this statement. But now, we read that verse first thing. But now, is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? He is risen. That means others shall be risen. That means that our preaching is not in vain and our faith is not in vain and our hope is not misplaced. So let's look here at the proof of the resurrection. First of all, the proof of his prophecy. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 20, notice he said, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them, of them that slept. In that single statement, we see proof of hundreds of years of Old Testament prophecies being spoken of. In fact, the resurrection itself proved that Jesus was the Messiah. The fact that He did raise again goes on to prove that He was the Messiah because the Old Testament prophesied it would happen. Acts 2.29 says this, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, David, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witness. So David prophesied, this is back in Psalm 16, Verses 8 through 11, David prophesies way back then about a Christ that would die and raise up. Go ahead and look back there at Psalm chapter number 16. There's this Old Testament prophecy, so look there. Psalm chapter number 16. Look at verse number 8. I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore... My heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Here, it almost sounds like David speaking of, of himself in the beginning of verse number 10. But when you see, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption, you realize he's not speaking of himself. He's prophesying here. Not only was he a great musician and warrior and king and a man after God's own heart, he was also prophetic. Of course, that is a prerequisite for any of the books of the Bible that were included into the canon of Scripture. One of those prerequisites is that they were prophetic. Well, David was prophetic. He was a prophet. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption, he says. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures Forevermore. Even David himself prophesies about this. Jesus, the Messiah, he answers that call, and there is the proof of the prophecy, Old Testament prophecies of the resurrection. Jesus Christ is that proof. But then in the second half of verse number 20, I want to look at the proof of his power. We have the proof of his prophecy, the proof of his power. If Christ is victorious over the death and grave, then this is power indeed. What kinds of power are we talking about? Look at Acts 26. Well, you can go back to 1 Corinthians 15, and I'll read Acts 26, 23 to you. It says this, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles first. What kind of power are we talking about here? Well, first we're talking about power over death. You say, well, obviously. Well, yeah. But this is the, one of the more important powers of what we're talking about here, power over death. Inevitably here, when we speak of Christ's power to rise from the dead, there are going to be some who scoff. And you say, they're just talking about a story from the past that cannot be proven. It is hearsay. It is fantasy at this point. I heard a story about a lady who was riding on a plane and she was nervous about flying and so she sat there and was reading the Bible um, as they were preparing to take off and a gentleman was sitting beside her, looked over and he saw what she was doing and he said, you don't really believe the Bible, do you? And she looked at him and 
said, well, yes. He says, for instance, you can't really believe that a man got swallowed by a whale and stayed in its belly for three days and lived. Actually, yes, I do believe that, he said. I believe every part of the Bible. That's ludicrous, the man said. How could that have happened? He said, well, I mean, I don't know all the details, but I'll have to ask Jonah when I get to heaven. Oh, what if Jonah isn't in heaven? This sweet, kind old lady responded, well, then you can ask him. There are many who are very skeptical about the scriptures and about our faith in the power of God, but that is exactly what faith is. Faith is choosing to not just believe, but then to rest our actions upon something that we cannot witness, upon something that we cannot prove, upon something that we cannot tangibly grasp our hands upon and test its strength. I cannot scroll back and find the resurrection and watch it. I can't find it in the security videos. I, the, the, the only account of it that I can find is what's recorded in scriptures for us in the Old Testament that it was going to happen and in the New Testament that it did happen. And I have to decide, listen, I know, I know man could have made this up. Now, that would have been a trick for all those men over 1,500 years to have written concerning the Messiah and to have agreed with one another over a period of 1,500 years. And that's how long it took to get the Bible written. It would have been quite the trick for them to have done a whole lot of agreeing like that. There'd be a whole lot more disagreements in the Bible if it was truly man's words. There's a lot of skepticism out there, especially about his power over death. But the resurrection proved his power over death. If he did not have power to resurrect, then what hope do I have to look forward to? Second, the resurrection proves Christ's power to save. If he can resurrect from the dead, if he has that kind of power, then what's to say he does not have the power to save? Remember when Jesus looked at the man that was lowered down through the roof and he told him that his sins were forgiven him? I wonder how much of a letdown that was to him or to the men who literally let him down from the roof. Wait, no, no, that's not why I'm here. <laughs> I was hoping for some sort of a tangible healing, something that I could, you know, get exhilarated about and, and run out the doors. This is kind of what I was hoping for. And the Pharisees and the and this, uh, lawyers in the back of the room, they, they were thinking within themselves and maybe even whispering into each one of those ears, this man says he forgives sins. Nobody can see if he really forgives sins. <laughs> he can say whatever he wants, and these people are just going to eat it up, you know. All of these, you know, sheep that are just listening to this, uh, you know, leader up there, this Jesus. One of these days, he's going to get found out for the liar that he is. You're, of course, Jesus knows what's going on in their hearts, what they're whispering to each other. And he says, just to show you that I have the power to save, I am going to heal this man too. And he told the man to rise up and walk. And the paralytic got up off his bed and he began to walk. What was completely a miracle that everybody around him knew. It was a miracle. Hey, if Jesus could do that, he could forgive sins. If Jesus could have power over death, that which you and I have zero power over. You know what boggles my mind is that there are independent Baptists out there right now that believe that not necessarily in the fountain of youth, but to believe that there is something out there, uh, a, a form of manna that will actually give them eternal life. It re really exists. I know a good man um, that served in a church as an assistant pastor in an independent Baptist church, got caught up in that, and is now out there looking for this super nutrient, uh, which brings about eternal life. I know I'm oversimplifying it, but um, it exists. Now, does Jesus have power over death? Absolutely. But can we discover that power and then harness that power in and of ourselves? Well, then that would make us a whole lot like God. No, I don't believe we can. We cannot reverse the cellular degeneration that goes on inside each one of our cells. Our cells die, they reproduce, they die. But over time, the cell plasticity begins to get looser and looser. Uh, no longer do they function uh, as well as they used to function, and our body breaks down. We cannot reverse that process. No matter what, you know, Caribbean island you sail to looking for the fountain of youth, or Florida, you know, looking for the fountain of youth, it does not exist. But what there is, 
is eternal life. And it's not just eternal life in a spirit sense, but eternal life in a physical sense. Let's not think that we're just going to go on to be spirits forever. Believe it or not, there are some that teach that. That we are just going to go on and not have a physical resurrection or physical bodies, but we're going to go on to be spirits. There are some that believe that mankind is eventually going to evolve to the point where they're no longer going to be confined by corporeal bodies. In other words, physical bodies that our spirits will go freely. Maybe that's just a very, very distorted view of heaven. Or it's just an attempt to discount God altogether and think that, well, if we keep evolving, something's got to happen, right? If evolution is true and everything keeps getting better, then something drastic's got to happen after another billion years or two. But we know what's going to happen. The resurrection proves Christ's power to save. 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. Begotten us again. So we were born again unto what? Unto a living hope and a live hope. A hope that is growing. A hope that is breathing. A hope that has a heartbeat. A lively hope by what? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I love the imagery here. We have been born again. We have been birthed once more given a new body, and we have been um, begotten us again unto what? Unto a living hope. Who is this living hope? It is Jesus Christ. And it is our future resurrection. Unto a living hope. And how do we have security of that living hope? By the resurrection, it says in 1 Peter 1, 3, 1, 3, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, verse 4 says, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Or unless you're one of the 144,000. I saw somebody saw, say recently that maybe the 144,000 are the children uh, who were um, killed you know, before they had an opportunity to get saved or hear the gospel. That's a whole lot more than 144,000. I'm not sure where they're getting their numbers from. Um, that's another strange thought. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Wow. You know, if it was only a reserve for a few people comparatively, then why in the world would he have stuck it in scripture like this? To us. Or was it only for, um, you know, the people that Peter was speaking directly to? No, it was for us all. How can God offer us hope, a living hope? Well, by the resurrection from the dead. It is because of his resurrection. It is because he is the first fruits, the first to be physically resurrected. He is the first fruits of that resurrection. We know because of that, he has the power to save and that we too will one day be resurrected. Imagine being one of the disciples. I mean, for us, we didn't see the resurrected Christ. And so maybe in our, some of our hearts, there is that doubt. But I mean, for the disciples to be touching the very man that they watched bleed out and die, the man who was buried in that tomb for three days, imagine being the disciples and seeing the physical manifestation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He must have been a sight to behold because three days doesn't leave much time for healing. wonder what his wounds all over his body must have looked like at that point in time. 1 Peter 1.5 says this, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Kept by the power of God through faith. Kept unto what? Kept unto salvation. Ready to be revealed in the last time, I was had read about uh, D. L. Moody, and he said this. He said, "The valley of the shadow of death holds no darkness for the child of God. There must be light, else there could be no shadow. Jesus is the light. He has overcome death. He has the power to resurrect from the dead. He has the power over death. He has the power to save." Thirdly, the resurrection proves Christ's power to keep, to keep. When I take Camden at night before bed, I, after he's in his PJs and we've 
prayed together and maybe read a story, depending on how late we're getting to bed. Uh, I pick him up and I'll stand him on the edge of his crib. And the edge of the crib is about that wide. Charity, when she was his age, she used to fall asleep on the edge of the crib. She would climb up there and her feet and legs would be hanging over the, the edges of the crib and she'd fall asleep up there, balanced on the edge of the crib. He hasn't tried that yet, but um, I'll take him and I'll stand him up there on that crib facing away from me. And now it's to the point where he knows what's going on, you know. I stand him up there and I back away. And of course he's like, you know, you know he doesn't want to fall. And he, he looks and he checks. And sometimes he tries to grab me because if he grabs me, then he can trust that and I'll catch him. I was like, nope, nope, you can't touch me. You have to just fall backwards and I'll catch you. And every night we do this. He falls backwards and I catch him or sometimes he falls forwards and jumps at me and I catch him or uh, sometimes I'll push him the other direction <laughs> and catch him before he you know, hits the mattress. Uh, and maybe I'm giving him good balance. Maybe I'm making him, giving him a fear of heights. I guess we'll find out in 20 years uh, what are the results of that one. But I told him last night, and I said, he, 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 he looked at me once, and he didn't bother reaching for me. He just fell backwards, you know, and I caught him. I said, Daddy caught you, and I'll always catch you. And then I corrected it, so long as I'm close enough. <laughs> I don't want you to jump off the crib in the middle of the night thinking Daddy's going to be there to catch you, and he's not even in the room. I'll always catch you, if, so long as I'm close enough to you. Uh, and, of course, in my mind, it's like, I can't feel that promise. I can't always catch him. There'll be a time where I'm not close enough or there'll be a time where I'm too old. There'll be a time where I'm distracted over here looking at this and he'll fall backwards thinking it's time for that and he's going to end up on the floor and I'm going to end up in trouble with mommy, you know. But I can't, I, can't, I can't fulfill my promise on that count. But there is something we can depend on with the Lord because he can keep us. I cannot protect my children from everything. No matter how hard I try, there was somebody out there who was stronger than me who could take them if they wanted to. I cannot keep them from every temptation. I cannot keep them from every evil or wicked. I cannot keep them from every bad influence. I can do my best and try. But you know, you know my kids have a heart and a will and a desire of their own, and they may decide to, to um, want things they shouldn't have and sneak around behind mommy and daddy's back and hurt themselves and destroy their own lives with those things. But I don't have to worry about a heavenly father who is incapable of keeping my soul for an eternity. You see, sometimes we discount the power of God. Discount's my new favorite word, by the way. Uh, sometimes we discount the power of God by, by, by putting salvation upon us. Oh, it's my job to keep salvation. I know I got it by grace, but now it's on me. I have to be good enough. I have to work hard enough. I have to seek forgiveness soon enough. And now the, the, the keeping of the salvation rests solely upon my shoulders. But that's not what the Bible says. Who are kept by the power of God through faith. Notice it was through faith, not works. Through faith, not being good enough. You are kept by God's power, not my power, not my goodness, through faith, not my works, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I'm thankful that the security of my salvation is not left to me because I am, a, I am stinky at security and at controlling myself at every point in the day. Just as you are, we would lose our salvation the very first morning after we got saved. And then having lost it, would never be able to regain it because we would never achieve a level of goodness to earn it back. You see, and I've said this many, many times, you cannot be good enough to keep something that you were never good enough to earn in the first place. And that's the way it works with salvation. Praise the Lord, we don't have, aren't responsible with the security of our salvation. We have been purchased by the blood of Christ. Does the blood of Christ become ineffective just because I fail to temptation? Does the blood of Christ become ineffective just because I continue to be a man? No. You see, he has the power to save. He has the power to resurrect from the dead. And he has the power to keep us if there is any loss of salvation, it is not because of us, but it is the fault of God. If there is a loss of salvation, it is because of His inability 
to keep his own children. It is because the blood of Christ was ineffective or defective and that the seal of the Holy Spirit upon us does not work and holds no power. But we know that that is not true. Ephesians 1.13 says this, In whom, Jesus, ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. His holy shed blood is not ineffective. It is, I'm making up a new word here, I think, superfective. I'm going to have to look that up later and find out if that's really a word or not. I think it is. It is now. Okay, they just don't know it yet. It is not ineffective. It is superfective. It is completely effective to wash away all sin and to purchase us back to Christ, back to God, I mean, as His children for an eternity. And if at any point in time I cease to be a child of God, it is not because I was ever good enough to be a child of God in the first place, but His blood was not effective enough to redeem me or purchase me back. And we know that that is not the true. Or that the sealing of the Holy Spirit, like we read about in Ephesians 1.13, was not strong enough to keep us, but He is strong enough to keep us. So Christ has saved and redeemed us. He has the power to resurrect us. He has the power to forgive our sins. He has the power to save us. He has the power to keep us. He has the power to free us from sin. The resurrection is proof. What is it proof of? It is proof of the prophecies of Scripture like we looked at before. The prophecies of Scripture concerning the Messiah who is to come. Of course, Isaiah tells us, like we've been studying about on Wednesday nights, a lot about what's going to happen to the Messiah. We see that He is going to be despised and rejected. We see that even His own are going to reject Him. And ultimately, they're going to kill him, and he is going to become the blood sacrifice for all of mankind. The prophecies of Scripture. He's also, the resurrection is proof of the power of God. These are the first fruits. So we move above surface level, and the first most important thing we look at now, we've already talked about being rooted in Christ, okay? We've moved beyond salvation. And one of the first most important things we look at here is the power of the resurrection. By it, we can bear fruit in many other areas in our, in our lives. And I talked about at the beginning, two kinds of fruit. Spiritual fruit, that is. There's the spiritual fruit that we bear when we become more and more like Christ and the spiritual fruit that we bear when we become testimonies and witnesses and reproduce and lead others to Christ. And I said those are both intertwined with one another so that they cannot be parted or separated from one another. But we are to be bearing both of those kinds of fruit. And how do we bear fruit? It is not by making the determination that we will bear fruit. It is not by going and super gluing a piece of fruit to the branch or taping it on just so other people can see that fruit. It is by first looking at the root system and where we are planted ourselves. Hey, we have the benefit that most trees do not. We can be moved. We can uproot ourselves from the world, from vice, from finances, from all those other things the world has. And we can plant ourselves next to the rivers of water. We can plant ourselves in Christ first, in His Word, in His truth and wisdom and love we can plant ourselves in the right place. We have that great blessing. Next week, we're going to look at the picture of resurrection. Uh, continuing to talk about the resurrection here as the first fruits uh, when we come back uh, next Sunday evening. Let's uh, have a word of prayer here, and then we will uh, move over to the business meeting. Dear Lord, we do thank you for your great hand of blessing upon us. 
Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be able to see this resurrection in Scripture, Lord, so that we can learn from it and that we can see proof from Old Testament passages of what was said was to have happened. That we can see eyewitness testimony of New Testament people who, who experienced it and saw it. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand the value and the importance of the resurrection. Let's not set it aside or, or think it as invaluable or unimportant in any way, Lord. It is a cornerstone of our faith. And Lord, by it, we know of your power over death for our resurrection. By it, Lord, we know of your power to forgive us and to save us. By it, we know your power also to keep us. Lord, as the keeping of our salvation rests not in our hands, but in yours. Lord, I pray that you would speak mightily um, through our Bible reading this week. And as we talk to you and spend time with you, I pray that you would uh, speak to us and teach us and that your spirit would move in our hearts, Lord. I pray that as we read, you would just open up our eyes to some amazing things this week, to some messages, Lord, that we need to hear that are appropriate for this very week. Lord, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, I pray that you'd help our folks to be in preparation for your call. Lord, whenever you move next to send us in this direction or that, I pray that we would be prepared for that by preparing today, by preparing a walking and talking relationship with you via the mediation of your son. Lord, I pray that you would help us grow that relationship this week. I ask that you'd help prepare us. And Lord, when we are called, I pray that you'd help us to step out in faith when you call. Lord, I ask for your hand of blessing upon these things and that you would give us a good week. We pray for those uh, folks who are not well. We pray that you would bring healing in these instances, Lord, that we've mentioned. And we ask all of these things in your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen.